I'm Stephanie Ooze, the Food Security Office uh, Manager at NASA Goddard, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to engage with Harvest today. Harvest is our Food Security and Agriculture Consortium, as many of you know, and many of you have traveled long distances to be here, and we greatly appreciate the chance to share all the great work that's being done, and it, it'll just be a little bit of the work that's being done, because there's so much work, we can't possibly cover it all today. Um, but it's, the point is to increase the use of NASA data to improve agricultural decisions. And before I introduce our NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, to start his remarks at 9 a.m., I'll take a minute to provide some context. So why has NASA, and in particular the Applied Sciences Program, stood up Harvest Consortium and a food security office at NASA Goddard? As you all well know, the Earth is facing unprecedented food security challenges to feed a growing population with millions requiring emergency assistance every year. There is a critical need for innovation and big data solutions to help us build resilience against increasing, increasing threats of food shocks. NASA Goddard has a legacy of pioneering research toward land use and agriculture with decades of high spatial resolution imagery from Landsat and daily global MODIS observations, now transitioning to VIRS, that many of you have built your careers on. More recently, newer international and commercial sensors now contribute to the wealth of information about the Earth's system. Precipitation, groundwater, soil moisture, snow water equivalent, evapotranspiration, and vegetation indices are just a few of the variables we routinely monitor from space. And our NASA-wide food security team has created four fact sheets around uh, many of these indicators of vegetation health, water availability, water quality, and even air quality that impacts crop health. Um, we'll have these on the um, back table if you'd like a copy. Harvest builds upon that legacy with its seasoned University of Maryland leaders and their international capacity building experience through GeoGlam and Severe. This is a multidisciplinary effort with collaborations and connections across many NASA activities. Too many to mention here, but I'll mention the Western Water Applications Office. Um, and we focus specifically on the efforts of Harvest and its partners today. Now I'm delighted to welcome our NASA Administrator, Jim Bridenstine, who previously served in the U.S. House of Representatives on the Armed Services Committee and on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And a fun fact you may not know is that he was once an alpaca farmer, and he'll tell you a little bit more about it. But in all seriousness, ever since he was sworn in as the Administrator of NASA in April 2018, he has been a champion of science and exploration and specifically earth science and applications. Um, he raised the profile of NASA applications on agriculture when he spoke at the World Ag Expo this past February. Since then, NASA has been tasked by the president to accelerate our return to the moon, keeping our administrator extremely busy. We're grateful that he's taken time out of his busy schedule to talk about Artemis um, to, to join us today to engage with NASA Harvest. So please join me in welcoming NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction. It's great to be here uh, at the Harvest Conference talking to the Harvest Consortium. I do believe this is one of the absolute most exciting things that NASA does, which is take what we do, the discoveries that we make, the technologies that we innovate, and then applying it in a way that um, improves the human condition, not just for the United States of America, but in fact, for the entire world. That's what NASA's legacy is, it's what our history is, and it's what we're continuing to do today. She mentioned that I was an alpaca farmer. That, that is true. Um, I, for a period of time, I lived in a town called Fernley, Nevada, outside of Reno. Um, I was flying with the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center, which is the parent command to Top Gun. My job was to fly Red Air in an F-18 Hornet. In other words, I was the bad guy. I was a Navy pilot. Um, and when I, when I was doing that, I had the opportunity to, to purchase a little ranch and buy some farm animals, and I, I absolutely loved it. But here's the thing. Fernley, Nevada is in the high desert of Nevada. 
It's very arid. And of course, if you want to have a field of grass to feed your alpacas, you've got to be able to irrigate. Well, how did we irrigate? We irrigated from the Truckee Carson Irrigation District, which of course got its water from the Sierra Nevada mountains. And when we think about the missions that NASA does, specifically one of them is the Airborne Snow Observatory, which is, a, the question is, how do we measure how much snow is in the Sierra Nevada mountains and convert that snowpack into a water equivalent so we know ultimately how much water there will be to irrigate. And of course, this is one of the areas that NASA is working on all the time and improving our forecasts greatly. Uh, and of course, the way we, we do the, the Airborne Snow Observatory, it, we use LIDAR, uh, laser detection and ranging. And when we think about LIDAR, why does NASA use LIDAR? Well, we use it because we wanted to map the moon. We wanted to be able to map, in fact, Mars. And now what we can do is we can use it to map the Earth. And we do it from, from an airborne snow observatory, in other words, an airplane. Of course, we also use it from space when you think of ICESat and those kind of missions as well. But ultimately, we're, we're measuring how much snow is in the Sierra Nevada mountains. We're using LIDAR to, to measure the height of the mountains when there is no snow. And then we measure the height of the mountains when there is snow. We figure out down to a, a square meter how much snowpack there is throughout the Sierra Nevada mountains, and then we convert that into a water equivalent, all using LIDAR technology, which of course has been advanced by NASA. Then what we do is, is we take not just the LIDAR and, and figure out what the snowpack is, but then we, we figure out how fast is the, is, the, is the snow going to melt based on the color. So we use spectroscopy, another capability that NASA has advanced and continues to advance, for a whole host of reasons that have nothing to do necessarily with water or irrigation or snowpack, but ultimately apply it in a way that enables us to separate the colors of, of, of the, the reflected light from the snow and figure out uh, ultimately how fast is this snow going to melt and when is it going to materialize in a way that we can use to irrigate our land. So these are, these are things that I know this consortium is very interested in. Of course, I've had the opportunity to live it out um, 15 years ago or whenever it was. Uh, NASA wasn't doing nearly as much as it is today in this area. Uh, but because of what NASA is doing and the technologies we have advanced, uh, we're going to get really good. In fact, we are really good already at not just predicting how much water there will be to irrigate, but when that water will materialize and where it will materialize so ultimately water resource managers can make great decisions or at least the least painful decisions. And I can tell you, in the high desert of Nevada, there are painful decisions. We've got endangered species that we have to look out for. Of course, we have irrigation that we need to do for our crops. Um, we also have uh, things like fires that we have to be prepared for. We need reservoirs to be full, but we also need reservoirs to be empty at the same time in case there's a flood and these kind of activities. So this kind of activity, where we are very precisely measuring snow uh, from an airborne snow observatory, is, is of course going to be transformational for water resource managers, uh, also for the people that are um, responsible for helping us provide uh, water for populations to drink. The Sierra Nevada Mountains, of course, provide water supplies for San Francisco Bay and Los Angeles, massive population centers, which of course are also competing for those resources. So it's great to be here at the Harvest uh, Consortium. It's great to be here at this conference. Um, I do believe that when you think about all of the things that NASA does, this could very well be one of the most important things um, that NASA does, which is provide food security. How ultimately do we feed more of the world than ever before and mitigate uh, the ebbs and flows that, that come from food insecurity? And ultimately, that's what this consortium is all about. I want to talk for a second about evapotranspiration um, and some of the missions that I know people in this room are very involved in. So <clears throat> when you go to the desert of California, for example, we have ground sensors. Every one and a quarter square miles, there is a, a ground sensor in certain parts of the desert of California where we're very accurately measuring evapotranspiration. Well, what it comes down to is one and a quarter square miles isn't good enough for a lot of farmers because evapotranspiration is different down to, you know, quite frankly, a quarter of a, an acre, let alone a one and a quarter square miles. So when we take the measurements that we get from these ground sensors and we're able to combine it 
with MODIS data from Terra and Aqua, and ultimately Landsat, which I know was mentioned just a few minutes ago, and, and take what, what NASA is doing, combine it with what USGS is doing, and do partnerships, for example, with the University of California Cooperative Extension, uh, and get very accurate evapotranspiration measure, measurements down to a quarter of a square acre, down to a quarter of an acre, I should say. Um, ultimately, what we're enabling people to do is increase crop yields while reducing water usage and preserving nitrates in the soil. All of that is critically important. And it's all happening because of technologies advanced and utilized by NASA, not necessarily for this purpose, but ultimately finding an application for it that is going to be transformational for the food supply. And when we think about Terra and Aqua and Landsat and using those technologies to combine with the evapotranspiration numbers that are um, being driven terrestrial from, from ground sensors, uh, and then ultimately taking all of this data and being able to put it on somebody's cell phone so that a farmer somewhere in rural California can go to his spot on his farm and get a very accurate evapotranspiration number and apply it to his soil type and his crop and create a very specific irrigation plan and ultimately increase crop yields while, and we've, we've demonstrated this already, while reducing water use by as much as 25%. That's amazingly significant. Reducing water use by 25% while increasing crop yields and at the same time preserving the nitrates in the soil, which is why those crop yields go up to begin with. Those nitrates are critical for the crops, and by the way, when they enter the water supply, it costs a lot of money for water managers to clean the nitrates out of the water supply when it comes to, to drinking water. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars. So NASA is actually saving lots of money uh, for the American taxpayer while at the same time increasing crop yields, reducing water usage, um, protecting endangered species as a matter of fact because we know how much water we need to irrigate and those kind of things. I also want to men mention something else that I think is important. She mentioned, yes, we're going to the moon, we're going to go sustainably to the moon, and then we're going to go on to Mars. And of course, as the NASA administrator, this consumes a lot of my time. Um, it is also true uh, that we're able to do these things because of activities that we've learned on the International Space Station. And I want to talk for a second about how valuable the International Space Station is, not just to where we are today, but where we're going in the future. We are able to put experiments on the international, think of it as a big satellite, and we can put all kinds of hosted payloads on a big satellite. And EcoStress is one of those examples. Now I understand EcoStress is in its infancy, um, but the idea that you can measure the temperature of a plant from space in infrared and ultimately determine the stress of that plant is potentially transformational. And the idea that we can do that experiment on the International Space Station to prove it out to eventually maybe utilize it for free flyers um, is something that I think is important for us to understand. The International Space Station is not just about human spaceflight. It's not just about going to the moon. It's not just about going to Mars. It's actually being used as a technology demonstration capability to reduce our costs to improve ultimately the technological maturity of systems that will in fact improve crop yields. Um, and so EcoStress is one of those examples where we can measure from space in infrared the stress of a plant. And of course people in this room understand that when a plant becomes stressed because it doesn't have the irrigation it needs, uh, the stomata close. And when the stomata close, uh, it doesn't transpire. When it doesn't transpire, the temperature of the plant goes up. And we can detect that from space now, weeks, of, weeks ahead of when you can detect that with the human eye. Um, so I think all of this kind of capability is transformational, and it shows how NASA in its entirety can benefit um, not just Earth science, but also um, our space exploration all at the same time. And the International Space Station is a great example of that. The last thing I want to mention is the importance of another mission, I think, that is uh, fascinating in my view, which is, which is GRACE. 
the idea that we can measure the gravity of the Earth and how it's changing. And of course, the gravity of the Earth is not uniform. And not only is it not uniform, but it's changing all the time. And, and, and measuring from space the gravity of the Earth and then trans, you know, transforming that information into understanding where the water is. And I'm talking about water all the way down to 10 meters below the surface of the Earth. Uh, we're talking about the water in the soil. Um, and being able to very accurately measure water resources, not just in the soil, but also in aquifers and um, as it moves around the world with, with ice sheets and ice melt and everything else, uh, I do believe that GRACE is going to be transformational as well. It's already being used uh, for the National Drought Mitigation Center in Nebraska to help us predict when and where drought will materialize, when it will start, when it will end, and ultimately help us apply resources um, where, where we know drought will be. And of course, we've seen the benefits um, from not just GRACE, but our other, um, other um, instruments uh, that are orbiting the Earth. I, I want to read a quote here. Um, so when we talk about understanding drought, um, this is a quote from Martin Awar, Commissioner of the Office of the Prime Minister in Uganda. And he used our data to address drought in his country before it even happened. And this is what he said. In the past, we always reacted to crop failure, spending billions of shillings to provide food aid in the region. 2017 was the first time we acted proactively because we had clear evidence from satellite data very early in the season. Friends, that's what it's all about. Instead of spending tens of millions of dollars retroactively, we could spend a couple of millions of dollars proactively and prevent the disaster that otherwise would have occurred. That's what this consortium is all about. That's what the Harvest Consortium is all about. And because of the activities of the people in this room, lives are going to be improved. Lives will be transformed. Disasters that otherwise would have happened will not happen. So I really believe when we think about the exciting things that NASA is doing. Yes, we're going to the moon. We're thrilled about the fact that we now have this very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps that is going to enable us for the first time since 1972 go to the moon, this time with women for the first time. It's never happened before. And go to, did I hear a cheer down here? <laughs> All right. But it is also true that as exciting as that is, and the idea that we're going to Mars and making these discoveries, I'm sure many in this room saw that we had this massive discovery of large amounts of methane on Mars that, of course, increases the probability. I'm not saying we're going to find life, but it greatly increases the probability that life may have or maybe even does exist on Mars. Um, and of course, the idea that there's water on Mars, liquid water, which is a discovery made in the last year. Uh, maybe we need to send a GRACE mission to Mars. I don't know. But, um, but the idea that there's liquid water on Mars, there's a methane cycle on Mars that's commensurate with the seasons of Mars. All of these activities are very exciting. That's why we're going to Mars. It's why we're using the moon to get to Mars. But ultimately, what are we, what are we most proud about as an agency at NASA? We have elevated the human condition, transformed the human condition. The way we communicate, direct TV, dish network, internet broadband, some people are watching this right now live on the internet. If you're from rural Oklahoma, you might be watching this using internet broadband from space right now, which is the only way you could potentially get internet broadband in rural parts of not just this country, but all over the world. But the way we communicate, the way we navigate, GPS, the way we produce food, the way we produce energy, the way we do national security and disaster relief, understand weather, predict um, how the climate is changing. All of these things are technologies that are developed by this little agency that gets less than one half of 1% of the federal budget. Um, and ultimately, it has elevated the human condition in ways that if you go back to the 1960s during the Apollo era, nobody could have possibly imagined. And here we are, 50 years after Apollo, talking to a conference of, of people involved in agriculture scientists and technologists that are involved in the ag industry. Um, and we're talking about increasing crop yields while reducing water usage and preserving nitrates in the soil 
Who would have thought that? And the, the idea that we are continuing to, to use all of NASA's technologies to improve the human condition for all time. It's very exciting. So I just want to say thank you for having me here at the Harvest Conference. Thank you for being part of the Harvest Consortium. Know this, we know how important what you do is, and we are greatly anticipating um, so many achievements from this organization and this group. Now I'm going to introduce the next speaker, um, Lawrence Friedel. He's the director of the NASA Earth Science Division's Applied Sciences Program. Lawrence has been with the NASA Applied Sciences Program since 2002 and has served as a program manager for several applications themes. Currently he serves as a co-chair of the Interagency U.S. Group on Earth Observations. He co-leads an international group on Earth Observations supporting the Sustainable Development Goals and he serves on the National Space Club's Award Committee for Innovative Uses of Earth Observation Satellite Data. Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Friedel. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's really fantastic to look out in this room. I was walking around earlier, and it's really amazing to sort of this, this, uh, see the people that are really gathered here. So, thanks to the Harvest team for all the all the work you did to to uh, to invite everyone. Uh, it's really an impressive crowd. Uh, I know with uh, with agriculture and the use of Earth observations, we go back decades. I mean, we go back to Lacey and AgriStar. Certainly, there's FuseNet uh, and and GeoGlam, and and now Harvest is part of that. Um, we certainly recognize that many of you um, were part of many of those uh, programs, uh, and that there's many people that came before us that laid the groundwork in terms of using satellite data uh, for agriculture and food security sorts of things. So hopefully we can give a, a nice little shout out to them uh, and a little, you know, maybe silent appreciation for all the people that helped lead to this for all those different programs in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and all. Uh, as well as the fact that uh, that you all are now part of this legacy, uh, as well as, you know, we know that we're going to be training people, they're going to be doing this uh, after us. But uh, I think we, you know, it's on us right now to sort of see what are the advances that we can be making when it comes to advancing food security and advancing agriculture, using earth observations, using modeling, using different types of data uh, and all, and different technologies and techniques. Um, but because we realize that many different people here are working on many different aspects and facets um, of agriculture, food security and all, many different ways, uh, that, that it's this collaboration approach uh, that we really wanted to emphasize uh, and, and that's, that's part of the Part of the reason behind this whole collaborative and this whole consortium uh, is to see how do we help foster that so we can bring in the expertise from the different sectors, public, private, academic, NGO, philanthropies, foundations and all. How do we bring the expertise and the knowledge from these different, uh, from these different sectors together? And partially a few years ago when we in Earth Science at NASA decided that we wanted to, to pursue this consortium. Uh, it was because we wanted NASA back in the game. Um, several years ago, we had, to, we had to focus, because of budgets and personnel, we really had to focus. Uh, and at the time, we had to sort of forego having an agriculture program. Um, but because of some benefits and all, and some of the um, um, activities that we pursued, we were in a position again that we could pursue agriculture and food security. Uh, and so that we wanted NASA sort of back in, back in this and, and working together with, uh, with everyone. Um, we knew that there's lots of talented organizations involved, but we also knew that NASA's role um, was to support all the organizations that are doing this. We knew that our data and our research um, uh, could help support where there were holes, holes in the data, holes in the um, research knowledge and the te techniques and, and all. Um, and so that's where we said, okay, NASA, we need, to, we need to get back into this. But in doing so, we wanted to pursue a different approach. It wasn't just a matter of issuing a number of grants and sort of hoping that they, the information would make its way to, uh, to the organizations that really had the responsibilities to apply it in terms of the decision making and improving um, food security and, and, and all. 
Uh, and so we wanted an organization, this consortium, to have the flexibility and the agility to get in and out of projects, uh, to have a portfolio approach, to have some projects that were short term, maybe some that were long term, maybe some that were very focused on doing rapid prototyping, and others that may be supporting more of applied research that needs a longer time frame. Uh, and so we wanted this organization, over the course of it, to be able to identify new opportunities and then to respond and be able to get into those, realizing that in some cases the new opportunities they discovered might actually be more valuable than the ones they were already involved with. And so we wanted that flexibility so they can go in and out. All of, all of this was to support the um, adoption uh, and use, and how do we advance and accelerate the use and the adoption of the Earth observations, the modeling, the research, and other activities. Or to catalyze collaborations where other people can come in and other organizations could come in uh, and contribute what they were doing uh, and all. So that was, that was part of it. Uh, throughout all of it, we also wanted this consortium to help learn effective ways um, to advance this usage of Earth observations. And it was both technical and programmatic. Uh, and so we, um, part of this um, was to sort of see how within the government, how can we set up these structures uh, with this flexibility and agility. And so this is a programmatic experiment that we're having within NASA Earth Science to see is this consortium approach, is it able to achieve more than even just a, a, a you know, 12 to 15 grants that we might do in a typical solicitation? Can we achieve more through this means with essentially the same amount of money? And so what some of the desired reactions that we're looking for from, from Harvest, and I think to some degree we've already had them, but we're looking for people to react to the work that they're seeing from, from Harvest to sort of say, you know, OMG, I didn't know you could do that from space. Or especially like, you know, how can my organization do that? That's some of the outcomes that we're looking for. We're wanting those sorts of reactions. Uh, and I have to say that we're extremely proud um, at NASA and NASA Science uh, of the work that you all ha have already done uh, within Harvest. Um, and we know that there's been some struggles and some challenges and we've worked with you all on them. Um, but I have to say, you know, given the, the short relatively short time frame that Harvest uh, and you all in this consortium, both directly and sort of indirectly, uh, it's really impressive, the, the sorts of things. And so we're quite proud. We certainly know that there's lots more to be done and we want to be working with you to sort of see how to, how to further this even more. But when you think about what you and your teams have done, um, I really want you to sort of take a moment to just sort of celebrate the fact that we have, we have moved along uh, and then we have progressed uh, and then you know, we need to get to work on, okay, well, what more can we do? But please take that time to, to sort of celebrate uh, on, on these things. Uh, and especially to the Harvest the Consortium team, um, we're especially proud of you all and thanks to everything that you all have done. Um, it's not just that you're working in a consortium, but you're also working on the consortium to try and see how to, how to make this approach even better and helping us learn for future consortia or for other approaches, uh, what can we do to help foster these activities. Some of the other sorts of objectives that we're looking for from this consortium is helping to identify ways that the agriculture community and the food security community, food security, um, community can get more engaged in future missions that we're gonna be having in the earth science area. Um, how is it that you can help identify and provide information into what are the observations that we're making? What's the latency? What's the data formats that are sort of, so as we're formulating these new missions, we are looking for organizations from the application side, from that decision support side, in addition to the researchers, how do we help um, allow you all to be part of that so that we're designing these missions for applications as much as for research activities. And so that's something that we're also looking for the Con Harvest Consortium to help you all understand when and where and how to get engaged in doing those activities. In addition, we fully recognize that some of the discussions we're gonna be having are gonna be identifying new research topics uh, and we want that surfaced. Um, I have a dream that someday NASA is gonna have a food security science team to complement the act application oriented activities of a, uh, of a Harvest Consortium. But it's gonna take this community, one, identifying what those research topics are and then helping to advocate so that there is a research or a science team to, um, to go along with this. 
through the interactions, we have certainly have heard um, that there is strong interest in the agriculture community about evapotranspiration, as, as Jim just mentioned, and, and soil moisture activities and a number of other data products. Um, and so we are working on some, some new items specifically related to that. Uh, I'm actually going to refer to it a little bit later in the, in the panel today. Uh, so stay tuned to the 4 o'clock panel. Please, um, please stay tuned to the entire day. Um, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, it's a small but, you know, hopefully important um, and all. So in closing, um, just wanted to, to say very excited about today. We've been looking forward to this meeting for, for quite a while. We know that for the furlough, government furlough, or the partial government shutdown, sort of delayed it a few months. Uh, and so instead of being in chilly February, we're here in hot, uh, hot June. But um, excited to, to sort of see uh, everyone. Um, it's great to throw a little party and more people than you expected sort of show up for it. So it's fantastic. Um, but we also, as I said earlier, you know, Please take some time to sort of to, to celebrate um, where we've come, and please take the information from today and the thanks and the praise back to your teams. We all realize that uh, there's a large teams of people um, in our organizations that are supporting every one of us here, and so please take this and please take the thanks and the praise um, back to them. Whether it's co-investigators or whether it's a coder, or whether it's someone who might be your travel assistant, or maybe someone who is the resource analyst, um, please, it takes, it takes teams of people uh, to help um, support us in terms of you know, coming to meetings like this. So please take it back. Um, and thanks to you all. Uh, thanks to everything you're going to be contributing today, as well as uh, into the future on this. So very exciting. Thanks again to the Harvest Consortium. At this point, I have a fantastic pleasure uh, of introducing Inbal becker Rachef. Um, really, really, one of the, uh, you can sit down, it's going to be a while. Um, <laughs> it's uh, really, really someone who just is a huge catalyst for a lot of this sort of stuff and a, and a connector through, um, if not everyone in the room, hopefully by the end of this, today and tomorrow, um, every, a connector to everyone in this room. Uh, and so Inbal has really had just significant and sustained contributions on the whole application of Earth observations, satellite information to agriculture, agriculture monitoring um, from the field to, to global scales. Uh, it's really sort of supporting decisions on food security uh, and agricultural markets. Um, we know that she's done this directly as well as through teams that she's been on uh, and teams that she leads. Uh, and, so currently, she's the director of the Harvest Consortium, the NASA Harvest Program, uh, and she's also the co-director of the Center for Global Agricultural Monitoring Research at the University of Maryland. Um, we know that she's had qu quite a bit of activities related to, to GeoGlam, uh, and she's the program scientist for the GeoGlam initiative, uh, and also was, was pretty key and critical um, supporting that initiative and getting it up and going and working with a lot of national and international partners. Um, closer to NASA Earth, um, she has been a member of our water resources team uh, and also on the severe applied sciences team. She's leading the food and food security and agriculture theme. Uh, and so fittingly, recently, the U.S. State Department uh, recognized her with an Aspire Innovation Award for her work in food security and technologies. So with that, Dr. Becker Rachef. Well, thank you very much uh, for that very generous um, introduction, Lawrence, and, and uh, thank you all for, for being here. We're extremely excited to be kicking off this um, engagement and, and, and conference day. It's a huge honor to have had the administrator here opening the, the meeting and, and really showing the strong support that NASA has always had and still has in their commitment to um, the strengthening of the use of Earth observations in support of agricultural and, and food security decisions. For, for those of you who, who are, are, are not familiar, um, what is Harvest? And uh, Harvest is a new innovative program, as I have said, launched by the Applied Sciences program, with both a domestic and international focus. 
Um, we're very much focused on developing and implementing agricultural applications with a wide range of, of stakeholders and, and, and users and really making sure that we're being guided by and all our activities are guided by end, end users and, and stakeholders so we're not working in a vacuum on, on the research side. Um, and as you've heard, we're being carried out by a coordinated multi-sectoral consortium, both across private and public sectors and across geographies really ranging across the world. Um, and we're also working to connect across various NASA applied sciences and, and research programs and various agricultural activities ongoing, including through SEVERE and, and the land, use, uh, land cover change program. Um, and, and have a strong focus on trying to, to demonstrate the socioeconomic benefits of the use of Earth observations and, and, and the impact of, of, of this kind of work. Um, and, and I think as you've heard from, from Lawrence, this, is a, a, the, this consortium approach is an experiment and, and in our um, experience so far, I think that it's so far proving to be quite an, a successful approach. And so again, some context and, and background, which I already talked about, and, and here you go. Um, uh, really, NASA's commitment has been in, uh, long term in, in this space, and, and in fact, uh, goes back to the earliest days of, of agricultural monitoring, satellite agricultural monitoring. And you heard a little bit before about, about the LACI program and, and AgriStars from, uh, jointly by USDA and, and NASA. And that was the vision at the time. And if you look at where we are today, that vision hasn't changed so much. What has changed is our ability to implement it. Um, and, and so where a lot of, for a long time we've been hearing quotes like this one, which remote sensing is always going to be the technology of the future, I think we're more now coming to the point where this is actually the technology of, of today. And what we need to be careful about is to be very clear about where we are today in the research, where we are in our ability to, to transfer the research into applications um, and making sure not to oversell our capabilities, but at the same time promote what is possible and understand where there needs to be still a focus on, on, on research. And so while AgriStar, and, and, and especially Lacey, was, was launched um, following uh, major price spikes in international markets in, in the mid-70s, um, more recently there were in the in market price spikes in, in 2008 and again in 2011, and there was a real international recognition that we needed to enhance the information on, on crop pr um, production globally, and that this was really critical for implementing agricultural policies and for stabilizing markets as well as for food security. And so the G20 Ministers of Agriculture's response was to launch um, an action plan on food security and, 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 and uh, market price volatility. And within that action plan, they launched two initiatives. One you've heard of uh, quite a bit already on, on GeoGlam, and the other was AMIS, where the GeoGlam focus was really on stabilizing markets and enhancing the use of Earth observations. Um, many of you here today are, are, are coming uh, through partnership um, from GeoGlam, and, and GeoGlam has, has got a, a huge amount of contributions. Um, we've been very involved in both the initiating and, and today in, in, in still uh, very much participating in, in GeoGlam, and we have the GeoGlam uh, director here with us today. And that, that in that international forum really helped to forge the partnerships that led to the creation of Harvest. And today NASA, uh, NASA Harvest is NASA's contribution into this G20 program. Uh, and so who then is, is NASA Harvest? We're a consortium of, of over 45 members from public and private sector, um, from government and, and humanitarian organizations, and, and, and here's the, the mix of logos. And um, when we're continuously expanding our, our partnerships as we move forward. And our primary objective is to help empower decisions that support food security, stable markets, and economic progress and sustainable, resilient crop production through advancing the awareness and the operational uptake of Earth observations and focusing both on smallholder and large production agriculture. And so you've heard a little bit, but why is NASA involved in this and, and what is the merit and where do satellite data, um, how are they able to contribute to monitoring agriculture? Um, well, they offer a cost-effective and timely and transparent way to look at, at the world and, and to provide various indicators and information on our agricultural landscapes. And as I said, I think today we're in a very different space than we even were just a few years ago with major advances, both in, in the data sets that we have and in the observations that we have, but also on the compute side and on the analytic side and on, on, on the ground segment side. And that's really helping us be today in a very different position to help realize some of the vision that's been long held for um, since the, the early 70s. And so here's some of NASA's um, Earth observing fleet of satellites, a, a large range of, of various satellites uh, circling the Earth and collecting a lot of information very much relevant for, for monitoring um, our agricultural lands. And it's important that this information is timely if we're talking about agriculture and, 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 and so this is, for example, uh, what the world looked like as of yesterday. 
Um, it's not only important to have information that's timely, it's also important to have um, a long-term data record. And so if we want to look at how does the crop situation look like today versus the same time last year or, or a previous year when we know there was an extreme event, or how is the landscape and agriculture um, changing over time, it's really critical to have these observations on, uh, for, for a long period of time. But what's also critical for those of you who are um, on the operational side in different organizations and agencies, if you're going to commit to, to the uptake and to use of these data, you want to know that, the, that there's a commitment from the space agencies to continue to provide these data ships and, and to, these data. And, and, and there has been a strong commitment from, from, from NASA, but other space agencies as well, exactly to, to, to continue to do that. Um, as we all know, our agricultural landscapes and croplands look very differently across the world, and what that means is that we need to look at constellations and at different types of missions to be able to help and support monitoring these landscapes. And one of the big challenges is developing methodologies that are robust that can help um, monitor these diverse landscapes. Um, NASA is not the only one putting up missions, and it's got a strong partnership with, with ESA, for example, as well, and these are the, the Copernicus uh, satellites, and, and these have also really helped to, to revolutionize our capabilities in, in being able to monitor globally, but at the field scale on a near daily basis. And in particular, there's been a strong partnership between NASA and ESA, and also harmonizing and, and using the Landsat and, and the Sentinels, for example, in, in, um, uh, through the uh, uh, harmonized data set. And so while we were um, traditionally have relied on one to 250 kilometer daily observations, and these are still really critical for a lot of the monitoring we're doing, we're also now coming close to being able to, ha we have uh, 30 to 10 meter resolution on a global level, um, almost daily, and, and going towards having three meter resolution uh, provided through various commercial satellites. And so what is our approach to really accomplishing what we're trying to do is, um, and, and NASA Applied Science has emphasized this from the beginning, is that we have to be in everything that we're doing is end user driven. And making sure, and that's the only way to make sure that the applications are then going to have the impact and have the, the uptake that, that we're looking for. Um, we've forged strategic partnerships, recognizing that no one organization has a solution, and we really have to come together to, to address the, the, the various challenges that, we, that, that, that we're facing. And so um, looking really at the full data to the decision train, those providing the data, the research, all the way through various private and public sector organizations. Um, leveraging ongoing and existing activities and, and trying to enhance those. Building on the progress of various international organizations and, 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 uh, and GeoGlam and making sure we're coordinated with complementary initiatives, and also trying to communicate and, and articulate where our priorities and gaps are. And a lot of um, the way we're doing this is we're set up through some thematic working groups. And so these are uh, some selective our thematic working groups that are, that are being co-led from uh, partnerships across the consortium, and you'll hear from many of them today and, and throughout the, the rest of the day on, 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 uh, on, on the panels. And so what I'd like to do is give you some examples of our activities and a little bit as a teaser for the, uh, the different panels that you'll be hearing on from, uh, uh, for, for the rest of the day. And so the first one is really focused on, on uh, our role within international markets and, and trade, really focused on helping to reduce uncertainty um, and enhancing market transparency early and in, in, in throughout the growing season. And so this is a, a, a slide from, from uh, Dr. Gl Joe Glauber, you'll hear about later on today, on work that he's been doing with, um, in, in collaboration with Amos and, and with Seth Mayer. I'm looking at, these are looking at USDA uh, forecast errors over the past 20 years, and, and I'll let him talk more about this. Um, but really, the window of opportunity for Earth observations is when the crop is in the ground and, and ahead of harvest. And with a big focus on looking at how do we better and, and improve forecast, in particular on anomalous years or during extreme weather events. Um, one of our, our main activities then has been, and, 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 and goes back to, to again that launch of GeoGlam and, and AMIS, and, and when they were both launched, AMIS came to us and said, could you provide information for the major production export countries on crop conditions on a monthly basis, but that reflected an international consensus? And so we went back and, and worked very closely with, with AMIS, which is much more on the economics and policy side, and you'll hear again more from, from the AMIS secretary today. And, and we developed the crop monitor. Um, and so we have over uh, 40 contributing organizations that, that come together to, to put these publications out. The, we publish these on a monthly basis. And one of the main accomplishments was to bring together two communities that have been quite siloed, the remote sensing community um, and the policy and economics communities. And, and, and I think we need to not un underestimate the importance of just bringing these different communities together to better understand each other and how the, the, the data that we have can actually be used. Um, 
And so this is our, our, our assessment from this uh, past month. Anything that's in, in yellow is, is conditions where there, there might be, there are some concerns in showing which crops. And if we just look for a moment at, at, at the US, I think we're all aware of the, the current situation, and looking at these pie charts in terms of how much area or how much of the productivity is, is potentially being um, currently impacted. Um, and, and, and here's looking at Northern Illinois, one of the main pro, um, corn producing states. Uh, the image on the, on the left looking at last year versus this year and, and, and of course huge delays in, in planting and, and in crop progress and a lot of crops still with standing water in, in fields and, and this is causing a lot of uncertainty in, in, in markets and having big impact and again I'll, I'll let the economists talk more about this. Um, but this is what the satellite data looks like. And again, on the left side, northern Illinois, the same area, you see a lot of the crops already progressing in green. And this year, um, looking still pretty brown. And what we can do is we can also look at the, at, and, at, at the field scale and see where there is standing water or a lot of water in, in the field. And I think I know right now a big question is prevent plant and how many acres. And so this type of information can help inform some of that. But we're not only interested in, in crop condition, we are also interested in looking at yield and enhancing uh, our yield forecasting capabilities, which they have a, a role to play as complementary information to, to survey information, but, but they do have the advantage of being global and, um, and, and timely. And so these are models working at the, at the global scale, but we're also working at the national, subnational scale, all the way down to the field scale. Um, but it's not only important to be able to, to forecast production, it's also very important to look at end of season yields, and, and in particular at the field scale, and again, you'll hear more in, in this work from David LaBelle later on today. Um, and this type of information is really important for understanding yield variability, yield gaps, and helping to, to guide farmer best practices for improving yields and understanding which interventions have both been effective. But if we want to get down to being able to map at the field, fields, but at scale, so at national to regional scales, the models can only be as good as the data we're feeding them. And I think one of still the big bottlenecks on the remote sensing side is the ground data component. And so we can say all we want, we're in the big data era, which we are. I think we're still somewhat data poor, in particular on the ground observations, and even more so for smallholder um, in, uh, uh, agriculture. Um, we're again part of the equation if we're focusing on, on productivity is, is area and uh, a lot of work going on and again you'll hear more about this from, from Matt Hansen later on today on, on using earth observations for, for mapping at scale or continentally um, crop area and, and doing in season estimates on, on, and this is an example from soy. Um, and recognizing the, the potential and, 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 and where we are today in terms of our, our capabilities, there's, we've, we've seen a, a huge amount of um, increasing interest from the private sector in providing information and, and data and, and, and services, utilizing Earth observations for, for a huge range of, of um, agricultural applications, with billions of dollars really being invested into this community. And we recognize, and, and it's a strong focus for us in Harvest, that the only way to reach our, our goals and, and, and to realize um, this, this vision is by partnership, and it's got to be public-private partnerships. And so we're looking at various ways in, that we can create new business models and win-win and, and situations across and, 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 and um, mutually beneficial propositions across public-private sector. Um, we recognize this is still a huge cha challenge, and we'll have again a panel uh, discussing specifically this later on today. Um, but to give some examples on, on, uh, of, of the work being done through the consortium, this is from Applied Geosolutions. Again, you'll hear from them later today, working um, on, on things that you've already heard uh, earlier today by the administrator, on supporting tools for water resource management. And, and this is, uh, they're working in, in, in an example from Arkansas in, in, um, on rice. Um, the other focus we have then is looking at, well, how do we address this big data gap of, of ground information? And, and we've been working very closely with, uh, with Swiss Re to, to think about how can we look at some mutually beneficial propositions and, and have launched a big uh, ground data collection initiative um, on the big production uh, countries. And, and we're looking now to initiate a similar initiative for smallholders. Um, and so that segues into the, 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 the third thematic uh, panel on, on food security and, and early warning and recognizing that while we have a lot of uh, really advanced the capabilities for monitoring big production in, in, in agricultural areas, there's still a huge amount of uncertainty and, and even, even bigger need for being able to, to increase our, our accuracy in, in forecasting and, and monitoring the countries that are most at risk to food insecurity. And so uh, following the Crop Monitor for AMIS, the humanitarian organizations 
came together and said, we have an even bigger need for understanding and, and, and reducing uncertainty around food insecure countries. And so we launched the, the Crop Monitor for Early Warning, and this really brings together the, the major humanitarian organizations as well as regional organizations, and many of you are here today in, in the room, and again, you'll hear more about this today. And this is from the last assessment, and, and you can very quickly see um, the poor and, and crop failures in, in southern Africa and also the, the in, in eastern Africa. And to highlight that, this is a discrepancy map. So this is looking at through time, uh, d just to highlight, you know, how many there, there, when there was different agencies assessing the same location, where there was disagreement and massive, huge dollar decisions are being made based on off of this information. And so this is extremely critical for these organizations to be coming together, sharing their information, sharing their assessment, and reaching a consensus um, around crop conditions. And so now, given that we're looking at both the big production and, and early warning countries, we will soon be starting to release global uh, reports as well. Um, and just to say, this has already had a huge impact, um, the, 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 the geoglam crop monitor for, for early warning and informing quite a lot of, of, of decisions. Um, but we're also looking at, and, and within our, our portfolio, we also have um, uh, tried to, to have a, a range of, of products and application ready levels in, in, in the terminology of, of NASA. And this is more of an experimental project that we have on, on trying to help fill the gap um, of, of uh, weather station data, and, and this is um, looking at some innovative modalities for cheap and, and self-reporting sustainable rain gauge information. Um, we, of course, also have a very large focus, and if, if, our, if our objective is for uptake of information, is, is doing a lot of capacity transfer and working with, in particular, ministries of ag um, agriculture across Eastern Africa. And again, many of you who actually are implementing and using this are, are, are here with us today, and you'll hear more about that. Um, but really what this has done is, is there, there are now national crop monitors uh, being run and developed and with a national mandate in, in, in several of these countries um, that, are, that are being operationally uh, run by, by ministries of, of agriculture and having quite a large impact. And, and uh, I think the, the administrator has, has already um, uh, described this, this example and, and read Martin Award's quote. He was supposed to be here with us today, um, but had an emergency back in, in Uganda and was called on by, by the the, the president. So unfortunately, he, he's not here with us today, but he's been a huge supporter and advocate and really demonstrated uh, the use of, of this type of information. And, and you'll hear more about this today from, from, from Catherine on, on the impact of, of, of this work. And so to summarize, I think it's, it's a really exciting time for satellite-based agricultural monitoring with really the new area, era in terms of our capabilities re revolutionizing what, what we can do. Um, and we're seeing them play in a cre satellite data playing an increasingly uh, central role across the agricultural sector, from public to private sector. But we also recognize that realizing the full potential and, 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 and bringing the promise of satellite data requires one, stakeholders' communities to really be driving the applications and, and the research. Um, to be innovative in the science and technologies um, requires partnerships across countries, across organizations, across sectors, and it requires a long-term commitment by the space agencies for continuing to provide openly accessible data. And NASA is really taking advantage and leveraging and building on decades of investment by NASA and other organizations um, and to, to radically advance the uptake of satellite data for informing agricultural decisions. And I'll finally just close by saying while new data and technologies are enable, have a huge potential for progress, I think the only way to really realize that progress is making sure that we're partnering and communicating across communities often that have been siloed. Um, so just quickly to say the rest of, of the day, how we, we, we decided to set it up will be according to uh, panel discussions on, on four themes that I, that I highlighted, where you'll have some brief presentations from different information providers and, and stakeholders, followed by discussions in, uh, by experts in, in the field. And so with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, well, um, so this is, uh, we're gonna get into the, the panel discussion. This first panel discussion is, is focused on the contribution of Earth observations into agricultural markets and helping to, to reduce volatility and, and support stable markets. Um, and I think the, the G20 ministers of agriculture made it clear when they launched the, the 2011 action plan on food price volatility in agriculture that satellite data have a key role to play in enhancing information to support agricultural commodity markets. Um, and with that, I'd like to have the, the honor to, to introduce our, our first speaker. 
um, Dr. Joe Glaber. He's a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute and the visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, DC. But prior to joining IFPRI, Dr. Glaber spent over 30 years at the US Department of Agriculture, including as its chief economist from 2008 through 2014, where he was responsible for the department's uh, agricultural forecast and productions and oversaw climate, energy, and regulatory issues. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it to you, Joe. Great, thanks. Okay, thanks. Everything's good. Thanks, and welcome. Um, I really want to thank Imbal for the invitation. Uh, we've been working a long time together. Um, as has been mentioned several times, the, the, this effort stems out of a G20 effort that, that when markets were highly volatile in 2010, 2011, and again, um, price spikes following price spikes that had been there in 2007, 2008, the world was concerned about um, the level of, of information available to markets, uh, level of information available to countries. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things was to try to avoid some of the mistakes that were made in 2010, 2011, with countries putting on export bans and all sorts of things, thinking that they were stable, helping stabilize uh, prices, and while they may have been stabilizing prices in their own markets, they were destabilizing prices elsewhere. And so it was thought that, that having better information uh, would, would really help matters. And it was with that, uh, the G20 launched AMOS, the Agricultural Market Information System, and I think we'll uh, hear from someone from that uh, soon. But the other thing was GeoGlam. And um, as, as Imbal mentioned, at the time I was with the U.S. government, was the U.S. lead at, at the G20 um, technical meetings at that time, or the Sherpa, or the sub-Sherpa, or what were YAKS, I think we were called. Um, but the um, important thing was trying to, uh, uh, for me, I was interested because we were coordinating a lot of the supply and demand estimates at the time. And I think so this, this whole issue of what information provides to the market and how it helps consumers, producers, and others make decisions about allocating commodities and allocating inventory and allocating food and other things um, to, um, you know, to keep prices uh, less volatile and to Im improve the efficient flow of commodities. Information is very, very important. And that's not news. I mean, everyone knows when anyone who's familiar with this business knows that when USDA puts out a report, the markets, to, uh, futures markets and others typically move uh, particularly during times where a lot of uncertainty is being resolved. So during a production season, for example, when a yield forecast come out, you can see the, the markets are, are waiting that, they're anticipating that. There are, there's a whole industry of market analysts who put out forecasts of their own about what USDA is going to forecast. So I think that, that it, it, it's easy to see why information is important. And I think a lot of the studies that have been done show that information while you would think that with technologies and others that, that um, you know, maybe it's, these reports are less important or other things, but indeed, I think a lot of the reports show that they are, uh, or a lot of the studies that have been done show that these reports are even more important now, or at least have an even greater effect in terms of, of, of futures market activity and other things. Um, so uh, part of the project that I'm working on with Harvest, by the way, is trying to value this, this very thing. And I have a slide deck, but I'm not gonna go through it uh, very much. What I want to do here is just forecast on, uh, or to focus on one thing and, um, and kind of walk you through how uh, information is, is revealed and what the, the value of that is in, in one sense. So this is USDA begins forecasting in May of each year. They're forecasting for production that's going to occur for the most part in the fall of that year. So uh, they, they do winter planted crops, but also spring planted planted crops, and then they'll be harvested in the fall of that year, and then they're carrying through forecasts on that marketing year all the way to the next year. But not only are they doing it for Northern Hemisphere, they're also doing it for Southern Hemisphere. So these production forecasts can be as far as 20, 24 months out in terms of what they're actually making forecasts on. And um, here I'm going to focus on one variable, ending stocks, which are import, uh, typically an important indicator of 
a relative tightness in a market, uh, particularly when it's used visa, when it's looked at visa v consumption or other things. But here I just want to show, and you don't need to be a statistician to to know what these uh, to understand these uh, the measures. But it's just to say that. Early on, no surprise, forecasts, there's a lot of error about that forecast. So all I've done here is looked at the final estimate compared to what the forecast was 19 months out. That is when we make our first forecast in May. And there's a lot of, a lot of volatility there. That's, I think that's measured in metric tons. It doesn't really matter. It's just to say that a lot can happen over the next 18 months. And you can see that it's not just a straight line. So what that means is that uncertainty gets resolved in sort of discrete periods. That there are some, excuse me, some periods that are more important than others. And this water is going to go everywhere. That's all right. Here, there, there's a shelf down here. I can just bump it with my foot now. So, um, so, it, 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 so it gets resolved over time. But here you can see that, so, so now what I've layered on here, and I'll try to, I can see I'm blocking, you've got a crowd here, you know, and so your, your speaker will always be blocking somebody's view of the, the screen. You can see here that, that this just shows the same chart that Im, or, uh, Imbal showed earlier, that is over the period from August to about November, December, uh, where, we've, uh, where NAS is doing um, estimates of, of the yields, uh, crop yields for soybeans, you can see that a lot is getting resolved. That's that yellow line there. And that even, even but even once it, the January number comes out, they can be revised later, a year later, up to a year later, where we might get another estimate, and then finally some resolution there. But you see there's still a lot of uncertainty in that market, um, and a lot of uncertainty about demand, a lot of uncertainty about exports. Um, so for example, uh, Brazil, which is a, a major exporter of soybeans and a uh, competitor of the U.S. Um, in many markets, uh, you can see that they have a lot of their uncertainty because it's in the southern hemisphere is getting resolved somewhat later. And so, you know, you're looking at planting times in the late in the fall with uh, uh, yields being resolved in the early part of the next year. And so a lot of their uncertainty, again, you can see gets resolved. And over that period, so does uh, a lot of the uncertainty about ending stocks. Other things, um, if you look at other commodities, again, depending on where they are in the world, you can see uh, uh, some with a lot of uh, uncertainty. If you look at a, a country like Australia or you look at a country like Russia where you have a lot of volatility in yields because of weather, uh, they, they may start very, very high, but again, get resolved in, at various points during uh, time. Um, it's, and similar with maize, and I don't, really don't need to go through this much. Um, the point I wanted to make is that where Earth observation can really help is, as Imbal said, is, is if one can think about reducing forecast error either by an earlier forecast, which um, uh, in some areas of the world where we have less information um, and, and don't have maybe the sort of on the ground statistical surveying and other sorts of things, uh, earth observation data obviously give us a very quick or can give us very real time estimates of, of yields and area and other sorts of things uh, earlier than we might get otherwise. And then the other thing is forecast area is whether or not the forecast itself, the air, um, uh, we can resolve that by greater resolution and other sorts of things. And so I think to a degree these are questions that, that we're trying to answer, at least my, my uh, um, research partner and I are looking at, well, what, what are the costs of, of improving information um, and relative to what the benefits are. And so that's a lot of what we're doing. And uh, I think I'll, I'll um, just close with saying, obviously, the other thing, and I think we have a panel on this later, is um, you know, what the value of early, uh, for, early season forecasts are for things like food security. Does that mean that, that uh, identifying a, a drought early, does that help move, uh, uh, help uh, 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 the donor community move uh, assistance to those areas earlier? Um, and so those sorts of things, obviously, information 
really matters and information has a, a real value. And I think part of the, the thing we're trying to do here is at least put that in the context of, of costs and other things. So with that, let me stop and I'll turn it over to the next person and get out of the spotlight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Joe, our, our next speaker is, is Professor Matt, Matt Hansen. Uh, he's a professor at University of Maryland Department of Geographical Sciences and, and a, a leading remote sensing scientist with a research specialization in large area um, land cover and land use change mapping. Thanks, Imbal. Uh, I'm gonna talk more about the Earth observation side and where we might be going in to emphasize, really, we're in this golden age of uh, monitoring, in particular the temporal domain. That's really what uh, agricultural monitoring is all about, is getting the time step fine enough that we can really track crop development and production. And the expertise in, in this room, whether it's for yield or area or uh, condition forecasting is, is uh, world class. And uh, my example is going to be for crop type and area. Um, the, the rationale, one example recently is uh, China statistics, official st statistics being revised. And if you look at the graphs over time, it looks like we're getting more uncertain information out of China um, for a very important uh, commodity crops like corn and soybean. And you would think this is impossible given our improved uh, data streams and methods. So I, uh, our, our focus is, you know, how do we, how do we create uh, consistent global monitoring of commodity crops given the Earth observations that are consistent over the entire planet's surface. And um, can we develop methods that are consistent uh, through time and across space? And I think we should look more towards a convergence of evidence, whether it's a national reporting scheme or a, a third party NGO or um, a private company, we shouldn't have results like this. Uh, so that's kind of a point of emphasis, even for a conceptually simple theme such as area. Uh, our, our methods are really about using um, the satellite as an indicator product. I think another challenge for, for Earth observation is not to be too disruptive to traditional methods. So our approach is based on field sampling using probability-based methods, which is a traditional construct for statistical estimates. So the satellite uh, products that we make, they're not pixel counts. We use the satellite to target our theme of interest, for example, soybean or corn or wheat and then we go to the field. The, the satellite gives you a very uh, robust uh, approach, a uh, method for, a reference for finding homogeneous uh, populations uh, such as uh, soybean cultivated area. And then we, in the end, we make a map, the best map we can. And of course, maps have a whole other use case in terms of uh, looking at changes in landscapes and rotation and other, other land use practices. But the statistics are really sample based and that fits kind of standard approaches. What's really fun about, uh, I make the joke, we do a lot of forest mapping as well, and I, I joke that when the forest is gone, we gotta be experts in agricultural monitoring. So I spread the risk by focusing on agriculture. But agriculture is much tougher. I mean, the, you're talking about a human signal, the, the different crop types, the cultivars, the irrigated, non-irrigated, rotations, it's awesome to try and characterize even a simple theme such as soybean at a continental scale. So we're dealing with different, uh, different uh, signals and we're trying to tease out just one particular uh, commodity. And that this graph kind of represents that. We can uh, train algorithms and run them at scale. So we can run North America, we run South America, we, 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 tie, we try to get a, a kind of continental scale uh, season uh, and kind of phenological growth period. And from that history, if we build up the time series, we can know where the dominant soy or corn or wheat cultivation areas are and build a stratification around that. So we can say, where's the core densely planted areas versus the more lower density areas? And then throw a sample within these strata and, and then go to the field. So instead of having kind of a fixed, uh, a fixed um, uh, sampling frame, it's more dynamic. And this is appropriate for South America. In our estimate, the last three years, Brazil's averaged 20,000 square kilometers more soybean every year. So places change. Africa, extensification is huge, and the projections for, for uh, population growth and uh, smallholder ag are, are big. So the, the landscape changes dramatically in a lot of parts of the globe, and the satellite effectively chases that signal and allows us to keep up with the land changes. So when we look at these uh, samples, <clears throat> We redo this every year, 
and we can go down and, and go to the field and by construction have a probability based uh, unbiased estimate of soy cultivation with known uncertainty. And again, that fits you know, statistical good practices. Um, we stack up a bunch of data. This is just a d data example. We, we, we go down to these, this block scale. We have a, a, a second stage sample. We, have, uh, you know, we do training data. And in the end, we stack up Sentinel-2 data, Landsat, um, you know, just to show you, we work with satellite data, I guess. And we map, <laughs> we map the soy, right? And we, this is a very precise reference of, for this particular landscape. And we can use this to extrapolate and get our area for the continent or Brazil or Argentina or wherever. I like this slide because it shows you that when we stratify using antecedent years, our algorithm for mapping, we get very homogeneous populations by the previous year. So our high stratum is really a lot of soybean. And our mediums is OK, and our low is low. So it's kind of like a first order validation of the signal. <clears throat> And then we can extrapolate and say 350,000 square kilometers of soybean plus or minus 6,000 low coefficient of variation and do this for all soy landscapes. Do it in the US, do it in Brazil, do it in Argentina. We're looking at China. And that was the starting point for this uh, slide deck was the uncertainty in China for corn. And the same thing goes for, for soybean. And it go, feeds back to Joe's, to Joe's point of uh, kind of reducing uncertainty and working on low latency. And then we can take these maps and create a final end of year map. So uh, Xiaopeng Song and our group is working on the 2019 map and we're gonna deliver that this month. So it, it, it kind of, it's not near real time, we're, 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 you know, they've already harvested, but have this field-based estimate that could be in the January, February timeframe, refine that through April and May and then make a final map in June and just keep going. So try to kind of make this uh, operationally uh, practicable. Key thing is how these places are changing. So when we look at uh, soybean in, 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 in South America, it's a, we, have a, we have a wonderful archive and Imbal mentioned the, 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 the need for long-term records and the implications for sustainability, um, effectiveness of policies such as the soy moratorium moving soy out of the rainforest. And so when we track these dynamics in the context of markets but also in the context of environmental impacts, we can start looking at growth of soybean in Mato Grosso and how this was very, very intensive up through 2004 and 5. The soy moratorium moved new soy out to the, the Sahado. So Mato Piba became a, the core area for soy expansion in, in uh, Brazil. Same thing in um, Argentina where the Chaco is the big site of, of soy expansion. So again, building really consistent time series, the evolution of crops and landscapes and, and adding value to their use uh, beyond just uh, markets. And we compare this with USDA data and again trying to not be disruptive but to try and see how we correlate well with official data um, but this method can be used in different contexts outside of the na particular national uh, uh, efforts. So this is an example of the same method applied across the U.S. and well, across North America. We've done this for four, four years now, uh, the same method. This, 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 uh, these estimates represent almost 90% of soy production. If we had China, we had India, we're you know, low 90s, 95%. And it's the same method, same data sets. So it's kind of, this is kind of, a, again, a strength of the uh, remote sensing and the signal is, is, is synoptic and we can exploit it in such a way that we create kind of internally consistent records of, uh, of agricultural production. And you can read that if you like, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Matt. I'd like to invite our, our next speaker, Esteban Cupati. He's an engineer agronomist and heads the Agricultural Estimation Department at the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting us to participate in this panel. I am here representing the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange. The Grain Exchange is a non-profit institution founding, founded in 1854. It's the oldest commercial institution in Argentina. The main characteristic of uh, the composition of our board of directors is that half of them represent the demand side of the market, and the other side represent the supply side. Uh, this particular composition uh, ensures the neutrality and the unbiased of our reports. I am the head of the Agriculture Estimate Department, and since 2000 season, we have published 
planted area and production estimate for crops that are traded in the local and in the international markets, such as soybean, corn, wheat, and barley. Argentina is one of the, as you may know, Argentina is one of the key players in world crop production. And every Thursday at 3 p.m. local time, we release free weekly updated report to the market. Since 2000 season, we have been tracking the development of many key variables um, and, and, uh, on a national or regional scale. Our data has an impact, not only in the news, in the local news, but also in the international press. And it helps to the, make, to the making decision process or, of mar market players. Most of our work on data collection, most of our work is focused on data collection by doing um, crop tours or telephone service. And during uh, all this time, we have done more than 200 crop tours. We go to the field to, to take uh, ground data, and if the crop tour gets too moody, we can uh, survey each region from the air too. And now, thanks to the consortium, we are studying each region from the space. Having said that, I'm here to briefly talk about our experience by using remote sensing for measuring crop production in Argentina, and how the consortium has helped us to improve our work. In 2015, we started to work with GIS software and earth observation techniques. And we immediately realized um, the potential of these tools. Most of the variables we study every week can be used to calibrate satellite imagery process. We created our own winter crop mass by working with Landsat images. And we, share, we started to share this, info, this, this mass with people, with the specialists from Maryland University, who help us to improve our processes and to evaluate the accuracy of our masks. Winter crop mass in Argentina, more than 90% of the winter crop planted area uh, is uh, occupied by wheat and barley. And we have reached high accuracy, especially in a large scale, especially in key region, in key wheat and barley regions. The university put us in contact with several experts that were also studying what was going on in Argentina. In 2017, we joined the Matt Hansen soybean project, and we, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> And we, will, we collaborated with him by collecting ground data. But we also uh, collaborated with Sergei Skakum and Belen French in their studies of winter crops in Argentina by sharing ground data, crops calendars, and harvested yield at the county level. In the same way, Sergei gave us 17 years of low resolution winter crop masks at national scale. His work captures the negative impact of the implementing poorly thought out policies in Argentina. Between, um, from 2008 and, and 2015, our wheat and corn were affected by export taxes and export quotas. And as you can see in, this, uh, in these maps, uh, our planted area was plummeted during that period, you know, because this, the, these measures affected also the planting decision of our farmers. And Sergei's masks were shown by our national news. Uh, at the same time, after a couple of years making our own high resolution winter crop mass, we started to overlap them in order to identify possible mistakes or errors. And we realized that we could easily track crop rotation of winter crops. Crop rotation is a key variable in non tillage production system. No? And in Argentina, more than 90% of, of the crop area is. Uh, is cultivated by non-tillage man management. So in the near future, we will be able to understand the rotation among summer and winter crops and in, a, in a time series to objectively assess how sustainable uh, Argentine crops production is. In 2017, we were invited to join NASA Harvest Consortium. And last year, we attended its first workshop in Bellsville. This was a key opportunity to, with, to meet with colleagues that uh, have similar goals. We met colleagues from Boston University that were studying what was going on in Argentina, among other regions in South America, and we began to collaborate with them 
by sharing large amount of regional uh, data. Four years of grand truth and crop calendars at regional and national scale. As a result of this first international in interaction, we already have four years of field boundaries data in shape files and the result of their work will also contribute to the improvement of our own knowledge of our own agricultural region. Every time we join this kind of project, we realize that uh, there are a lot, a lot of experts on remote sensing techniques who are able to run complex methodology, to process large amount of data, to do for, um, to, to process large amount of data from different sensors, to identify crops with extremely high precision or to map clima, climate variable event, events such as flood or frost. But how many can understand the difference between registering a, a frost during a vegetative or reproductive stage of a crop? How many understand break-even yields and can to predict how much of the crop mapping area are, uh, will be harvested or not. In the same way, we, the agronomists, we can't, uh, we can't process large amount of data. We don't, have to, we don't know how to work with active sensors. We don't understand Python programming. For that reason, I'd like to say that we have established win-win relationship with the consortium. The consortium trained us on how to study different key variables at large scale. Last January, we received a visit from Mike Humber. Mike Humber is a senior faculty specialist from the University of Maryland, who taught us how to map soil moisture, floods, and DVI, among other key variables. And now we can cross-reference these studies with phenological stage of crops in order to better understand if floods or drought could affect years or not, as well to understand if these negative factors are affecting key productive regions or just marginal areas. And this is thanks to the power of mapping data that allow us to significantly improve our understanding of what is going on at the field level. With all this kind of analysis, and now we can objectively, uh, objectively explain to market players whether or not the climate anomaly will affect crop production. As I said before, we started to work with earth, earth observation techniques in 2015, but between 2015 and 2018, it took us an average of three weeks to download, to search, download, clean, and process satellite imagery for mapping winter crops. The consortium has been a strategic partner on this area. And thanks to my exchanges, this will be the first year, year we will run our winter crop methodology in Google Earth Engine, combining Landsat and Sentinel-2 images. Um, accessing large scale result in a matter of minutes instead of weeks increasing our, our productivity exponentially. And this will represent a significant improvement not, uh, not only for our work, but it will also represent a significant improvement for those that have to take to make decisions using the information we release every week. This year, we will be able to make planted area correction a month earlier than the previous season, improving the accuracy of our data during the ongoing season rather than at the end. During all these years, we have strengthened our relationship with the different members of the consortium, establishing win-win relationship, providing information for conducting research and receiving training from experts that push the frontiers of these technologies. After all these positive things, and to conclude, let me tell you about the challenges we have had. So far, we have improved the methodology for making winter crop planted area estimates, and at the end of last year, Matt sent us the result of his soybean mass but so far, we haven't objectively studied our corn planted area, the second largest crop in our country, and Argentina is the third largest exporter of this crop. On the other hand, soybean and corn account for more than 70% of the, our total crop area, and we are still far, for, uh, we are still far from timely confirm or correct their planted area estimates with this, within the season, when the decision maker from the private and public sector mostly need the information. We can adjust under or overestimation of planted area and its, and its production once the campaign is over. And that helps us to improve the accuracy of our numbers. But we cannot undo bad decisions made by market players due to the lack of information at a critical moment. We hope that working together, we will obtain objective, objective information earlier during the season. Um, before finishes, finishing, we prepare a short video that we would like to share with you. Founded in 1954, the Buenos Aires Iberian Exchange has been a pillar 
of the institutional framework that has allowed for the development of the Argentinian agricultural sector. Among its goal is to provide high-quality high public information to promote market transparency and improve decision-making throughout the entire value chain, reducing price volatility. One of the most important variables to this objective is the estimation for crop production and crop condition that we publish every Thursday in our weekly report. The grain markets have uh, a particular condition in terms of supply that is that the uncontrollable variation of the production all over the world. If all sides of reality have the possibility to precise in a timely manner the level of production on Argentina, probably we will have in our hands the best level of we come to manage this risk, the prices that we see all the time in our local markets. Crop estimation is one of the main issues in our markets, the agri commodities. Because of that, all the efforts that uh, you can uh, do in this kind of business uh, to get accurate figures is where we work. Uh, having accurate data is not only important for the market, it's important for planning, it's important for budget, for the government. It's really important to have a private organization such as La Bolsa, to have good, trustworthy, reliable statistics, so be able to compare with the government. It would be very interested in having the latest technology applied to uh, these sort of statistics, especially in Argentina, which is so big and the area covered in so different, so many different crops and different latitude. Our market participants take into account the information provided by the grain exchange when taking a position in the market. New technologies will provide greater objectivity and precision to estimates. The, the reports of the grain exchange are essential for price discovery and having a futures market and good information on production helps reduce volatility in the industry. The consumption will allow us to overcome our limitations and work with technicians worldwide who are on the cutting edge on these topics. Therefore, we have great expectations for what we can achieve together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esteban. And so we're going to switch gears a little bit and, and go into a, a discussion uh, of, of the panel. And what we tried to do on, on the first part is, is give a little bit of an overview on, from the perspective of markets and policy, some of the current state of the science, and then a, 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 a stakeholder and end user perspective and, and how they're able to adapt and, and, and uptake this type of technology. Um, I'd like to now uh, introduce our, our panelists. Um, our first one is, is uh, is going to be remote it's, uh, um, through, uh, so we'll, we'll just hear his voice, but I'd like to introduce um, uh, Abdulreza Basian. He's a senior economist at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. He's leading the FAO short-term outlook team and is responsible for market research and analysis related to major agricultural commodities. Um, he was appointed secretary to, uh, of uh, the AMIS initiative, which you've heard a lot about since 2011, and he manages the AMIS activities, including the monthly publication of the AMIS Market Monitor. Um, and with that, Abby, are you, can you hear me? Oh, good, Wait, and we can even see you. You hear me? I think we need to turn the volume up. Hello. Yeah, we can, we can hear you. We're trying to turn you up. Can you hear us, Abby? Yes. Yeah. Clearly now. Okay. I do. All right, Abby. Hello? Sure. Okay. Hopefully this is, is going to work. Um, so, Abby, it's been eight years since both Amos and, and GeoGlam were, were launched under the G20. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the AMIS experience so far in terms of uh, utilizing and starting utilizing satellite-derived information and what AMIS's view is on this whole area and, and maybe some sense of how successful this collaboration has been eight years in? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, great to see all the friends uh, up there on the podium. 
And um, to answer your question, eight years, yeah, we are eight years older, all of us, I think. We all started it together. Um, it, and I think it doesn't need much of an introduction there. You have all the Amy's people sitting there. I know Joe, yourself, uh, Seth. So uh, I wouldn't bore you with, with the history lesson on that. But I must say it has been a very interesting experience for all of us involved since the beginning. Uh, the all started as sort of like an unknown process. We didn't know where it's going to end and how long it's going to take. Uh, and throughout this 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 uh, this travel, let's say, uh, we all learned uh, one way or another uh, the best ways uh, forward. And one of which has been a collaboration with uh, Joe Glam and I, I guess many people who are your audience today, which come from the field of remote sensing. Uh, it was not one of the very early things that we had in mind when uh, when Amos was more or less on his own, set up by G20 to um, to for, for the work. But it naturally became a, a very strong component of the of the work. Um, and if you want, I can I can elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, the point to make here is that uh, when it, back, I take you back a little bit to. Just before Amos, in September 2010, we had an extraordinary meeting here in Rome. Um, it was right at aftermath of the drought in Russia and a big price fight. And fear that the peak of 2007, 2008 uh, is going to be uh, quite, uh, quite uh, a problem for the global food markets. And uh, in that meeting, some hundred countries came. Uh, one of the one of the issues that w at least they could agree on was we were not very good in forecasting production, and uh, the request to FAO was how we could improve this. Anyway, I don't want to bore you with this, but what is important to hear uh, to 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 keep in mind is that extraordinary meeting uh, eventually led to the establishment of uh, Amis a year later. Um, and therefore, from the very beginning, among a lot of other factors, Amis was supposed to look into. The whole issue of making better forecasts for production uh, was critical and had the central stage. Um, and yet, the kind of way we looked at it uh, probably was not uh, up to date. Perhaps it wasn't as innovative as we would have wished so. And most of our early works, uh, and I'm sure Joe is there, can, can explain those better, uh, was more on the economic side of things. Uh, on the price side of things, on uh, you know the, the demand situation, biofuel, this and that, but we were not so much into the yellow crop. How good are those numbers? Now, Amy's had this privilege of having uh, all the major really uh, players in the uh, in the four crops that it concerns with, basically corn, wheat, soybean, and rice, as its member, plus the ten, ten international organizations that uh, take part as the secretariat. So it created a very powerful group of, uh, uh, let's, let's call them agents, where uh, they should, if they put their resources together, be able to come up with uh, a good, uh, good assessments of, of the market. Uh, and this was something that kind of separated us from, us, from, from other initiatives, even, even here within FAO. Uh, and that's how it all started, and uh, it was quite positive. But the whole issue of production and making product forecasts uh, remained a little bit ambiguous uh, until I think we, we joined hand far more strongly than initially with the Joe Glam. And if you recall, Joe Glam at the beginning was an actual part of the Amy Secretariat. It joined more recently. Uh, and one difference or one, adva one advantage that Joe Glam had for Amy was that you had all the national uh, agencies that deal with remote sensing um, uh, basically talking to one another and, 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 and having this sort of a network that you develop over time. And we became one of the first beneficiary uh, of, this, uh, of this network. And thanks to this, we managed to sit together, talk, and see how we can translate your language, your scientific language uh, of uh, uh, what you do in remote sensing into the kind of a, a language that uh, other market actors would be able to understand and uh, therefore make their decisions. And this this is the start of those pie charts. And perhaps involved there would be easier to explain at the right time what I mean by this. But those pie charts basically develop over a couple of months 
And it was only a quick glance way of for policymakers, for agents to just look and see what the market really looks like, what growing conditions are uh, in major major countries and so forth. Now, this, if I were to reflect back, I would say this was perhaps one of the one of the more important thing we did. It's not so big. It's not it's not uh, something that would be at par with what NASA does, obviously. But for our pipe work, it was actually quite a breakthrough, and it set the uh, I think it set the path for for more collaboration, more thinking, more working, and this has taken us to today. So today we have a system, a network, both within Amos and Jogland. We meet, as you know, very regularly. We talk to one another. We produce a report together every month called Ames Market Monitor. And you guys went ahead, actually, Geoglam and, and, and produce a report for the rest of the world, which is even more important, especially for vulnerable countries. Um, the way I see it now is that we do need some innovative thinking ahead in this process to try to get more out of what you can offer in terms of a satellite and remote sensing technology. And, and I think this is where I hope the discussions that you have in your, what it seems, extremely successful meeting um, would lead to, in terms of what sort, what sort of a roadmap you have for the next couple of years in order to use the facilities, the technology, and the network that is now available uh, to enhance it. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Abby. And I, I think. Thunder. Sure, and and I think what what we're hoping actually to hear from many of you on on the stage who are actually very much coming from the markets and economic side is what are the needs that can help to guide um, the the products that we develop so we avoid the mistakes of the past where we're developing great products that we think in, in a vacuum of research and and then wondering why they're not being used. Um, I'll I'll I'll. Uh, Maybe a quick other question for you, Abby, is, is and, and I think I'll, I'll follow up then with, with Seth as well, is given the recent increasing volatility in, in markets uh, at the moment, in large part due to uncertainty surrounding the U.S. crop, and I think we've seen some unprecedented month-on-month -month cuts to the U.S. corn forecast, both on the USDA side and, and on the AMIS side, as well as other organizations and, and IGC as well, um, what types of information do you think could be provided uh, that would help to reduce this uncertainty in, in, in markets and from your understanding? Uh, Understanding working with us for so long in terms of the remote sensing side. Right. Uh, well, this is certainly a good question and a very timely one. I'm not so sure I have the full answer for it. Uh, is uh, it is certainly a very exceptional period, uh, definitely in the U.S. and what's happening with the with the corn, and it's been an uh, in-game situation for people who are following the market for now some weeks. Um, I, 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 I turn this question a bit around, and this is, I mean, I'm just thinking loud on this because this really has been a, has been a concern. It's happening in a country with most advanced uh, information system, uh, both in terms of uh, satellite imaginary information and in terms of a mechanism to collect information through surveys and all kinds of analysis. So it's not just happening in any country. And, and therefore, if we cannot, uh, uh, if we cannot use the, the technology that is available uh, in these days uh, in a country like U.S. for this type of work, I just wonder uh, how one can really uh, go about and, and promote it uh, in other places. Now, this doesn't mean to be negative. I think it is very positive. I was just just before the thing started, I was going through my tweets and all these images coming out, showing, comparing now compared to last month, compared to last year. This is how corn looked like it then and how it looks like now. I think the, all this information are quite useful. What I'm not so sure is uh, how the information could reach me not from 10 or 20, 30 different observers, but from a place that I can trust, fully trust that they have done their homework, they have looked at all these different aspects, and they are not just giving me any information in order to influence my, my decision and that could eventually influence the market in, in a way that probably uh, is not the right thing to do. So I think this is happening uh, here, and I hope that through the initiative of Harvest, would eventually happen is some sort of a validation to what we see through satellite imagery that can can be a source of a, 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 a source of a objective information for the rest of the world to take on rather than looking at individual bits and pieces of this information. And I think such an experience such an experiment would be most valuable if it could be started or initiated in, a, in, a, in an advanced place like in the U.S. 
Great. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Abby. And I think we're doing a lot of thinking, and I think this year, and as do always extreme event years, um, new challenges come up, and we try to think through, well, how could we have addressed that, or how in the future, when that comes again, are there information products that can come from private sector, from public sector, from research to support those needs? Um, I think what I'll do is, is introduce, actually, the, the rest of, of, of the panel, um, and then uh, come back to you as well, Abby, on that. And so. Um, Dr. Seth Meyer is the chairman of the World Agricultural Outlook Board at the USDA, publishing the monthly World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, as, as all of you know, WASDE, um, which are closely watched by agricultural markets around the world. Uh, before joining USDA, he was part of the UNFAO Global Perspective Study Unit and a researcher and faculty at the University of Missouri. Um, uh, Arnaud Petit is, um, was appointed the executive director um, of the International Grain Council back in, in 2018. Um, and prior to that, he was the director for commodity and, and trade at the European Farmers and Agri-Cooperatives in, in, uh, Cooperatives Union. And uh, finally, uh, Ian Jarvis, he's the director of the Geo Global Agricultural Monitoring Initiative, GeoGlam, which we've already heard quite a lot about. Um, and uh, prior to, to being the director of GeoGlam, he had 25, experience, uh, 25 years of experience with Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, um, and had served as the director of Agroclimatic um, Geomatics and Earth Observations Division um, within Agri Agriculture Agri-Food Canada. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll proceed a little bit with, with, uh, with some, some questions, on, and, and one for you, Seth, and USDA clearly has long recognized the importance and huge potential of Earth observations for provision of agricultural monitoring, and going back, obviously, to the Lacey days, as, as, as we've heard. What role do satellite data play in the, in the current USDA forecasts, and, and how do you see this evolving in the future, and in particular in the context of what we've just been talking about and, and hearing from, from Abby as well, and, and in these kinds of events in, in a year like this year? So for, for satellite imagery, I'd, I guess I'd, I'd contrast that in the United States, we have NAS. And, you know, we were talking earlier about, well, we can get within 3 to 5% in yields. That's too wide for us at, in the United States. So we have NAS in terms of our domestic market. We don't have that everywhere else in the world. So we rely, and by we, I'm not talking just about the World Board. We're a collaborative agency, so we bring groups from all around USDA, and in particular, in this case, our folks from FAS. So we rely heavily on satellite imagery for our analysis around the world. But we combine it with meteorology. We have five specialists in crop development. We have folks on the ground, and all of those things we use together. So we're using satellite imagery as a tool. Domestically, uh, we tend, to, the, the folks at NAS do use satellite imagery, but of course their gold standard is going out into the field and measuring. But that's expensive, and there are gaps between when they're measuring, you know, they're doing this on a monthly basis when the crop is far enough along in development. And so from a commercial standpoint, there is perhaps some utility for satellite imagery either earlier in the season, with an understanding that it's going to remain incredibly uncertain, and then perhaps between reports uh, as the season goes on. So that's how we use satellite imagery at the moment. It's only going to get, technology is only going to get better. Right. And so in that case, how do you see it going on in, in the future, <laughs> given so, the advances that, that we're... So I think that, again, um, there's always going to be pressure on NAS to, to justify its expenditures on field level surveys. I'm not, I, I would say I'm not willing to give that up. We need that for our domestic market. I think what it will do in the future is we will, we can use it for special applications in the United States. So when you talk about flooding acre, flooded acreage this year in terms of, or prevent plant, when we have a plant, that's it's a complicated discussion, but you could use that to talk about when you have flooded, there was a discussion about grain silos maybe lost to flooding. You could actually do some of this tracking with satellite imagery, but on a foreign scale, Joe showed the fact that Yields and production and area within Russia is quite uncertain for wheat. They're the world's number one wheat exporter, and therefore nailing their production better will reduce fluctuations in the market for wheat prices. So for us, I think it will help us with large countries where we don't have as much information to improve market, uh, market function. Great. 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Les. And so then moving on to um, to Arnaud, um, and, and IGC is an intergovernmental organization focused on furthering international cooperation in, in grade, trade, and, and market transparency, very much similar um, in many ways to the objective of, of AMIS. From your perspective, what are some key information needs and opportunities that remote sensing analytics can support for furthering market growth and, and trade? So, um, first of all, so we follow 16 commodities and we are on track to add pulses in our portfolio activities. So you see how uh, I would say having a distinction and the mapping and cropping area is very important for us because it would help really to improve our market analysis. And I will not come back on the issue of time, of the timely accurate information. It has been well described by, by Joe, but I would like to add two main aspects. It's first of all, is a learning curve all this remote sensing is adding. Because uh, we have seen from the last three seasons, we have new events. And it's on time very difficult to interpret the impact on production. And thanks to the remote sensing and big data, now we have a more advanced analysis on impact on these uh, big events. This year it's for the corn in the US. Uh, we had uh, in India less rainfall, what, uh, what has been the impact, or in EU with a low luminosity on wheat production. So I think it's very important to have this learning curve process, uh, I would say, in mind. And the second point I would like to add is also what uh, Seth is starting to say, is we have a new country in pro entering in production and where we have not necessarily a full information or I would say uh, av available information. And here also the remote sensing system can help us talk about Russia or I would say Eurasia area uh, if we want to be more uh, wide where definitively we need more information. And I would say for the future also in Sub-Saharan Africa because we see some new development in production and rice for example. And as a staple food that's something we really need to Im improve I would say to have more market information. So I would say it's what we are waiting for. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you, uh, uh, um, and uh, and so Ian and, and I think um, many of you might have known Ian in his previous role um, when he was within Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, um, and and at that point you were um, the division director leading the Earth Observation Space Monitoring Unit, um, and in that role you you were able and in, and I think probably is correct to say th partly through these partnerships that we had engaged between Amis and, and GeoGlam where the Amis side brought the economics unit from, from Agriculture Food Canada and you were very much from the remote sensing side. But you were able in, at, at the national level to forge a very strong relationship with the economics division. And that ultimately resulted in the, the um, replacement of, of a key survey for, for Canada which is your, your September survey. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit about the evolution of, of that decision and, and how that has played out for, for Canada? Okay, well, for reasons that were well artic articulated here, uh, yield forecasting is an important tool. So we were working on the science for quite some years and it was, it was in pretty good shape. But as I, I often say, the science is easy, the, uh, the management and working with people is sometimes challenging. And this is a very good example of that because the statistical agency for Canada, Stats Can, uh, we're responsible for the official numbers. So it actually took us over a decade of starting to work with them and getting more familiar between the communities to actually have uh, this yield forecaster launched. But when it was launched, it was so tremendously successful because it, it saves millions of dollars a year in survey uh, costs. It uh, produces information which is more rigorous, uh, arguably, uh, than what had been done previously. And uh, from a political standpoint, it reduced the survey burden. And that was very important in Canada at the time. So building on that success since then, I was talking to Catherine Champagne, who's in the audience today from Agriculture Canada. They're now piloting a July, uh, a, a, a July replacement. So it, it's progressing. Uh, recently, staff at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada have been given deemed uh, employee status within StatScan, so they can actually go within the firewall of the statistics agency, bring the Earth observation data there, and work at a very high resolution level on 
new questions that we need answered, things like uh, early season crop uh, area and so on. And once we have early season crop area along with our modeled yield projection, well, we have the holy grail, which is uh, we, we, we start to get a better understanding of production earlier in the season. And I think that's some of the things we've heard up here uh, is, is kind of what we're sh all shooting for. Right. Right, and then I, I guess stepping into your, your geoglam role, I think you've advocated quite strongly for the need to, to continue to improve um, those, those estimates and those early estimates, and, and also um, very much encouraging and, and, and facilitating really that, that partnership. And I think what we see on, on this stage today is, is actually quite remarkable because we've got really senior economists and, and, and connected very much to the policy side and, and senior researchers in, in, in the Earth observation side. And I think part of the challenge of prior, prior why we weren't seeing the impact in the uptake that we wanted was there wasn't that communication. And today I think we all know each other quite well working um, for several years and really learning each other's languages, learning each, um, you know, where is it that we each fit in with each other's program and still obviously a huge amount of, of, of work to do, but, but a lot of that work is actually understanding uh, uh, partnerships and, and communicating with each other. Um, and so, as uh, within GeoGlam uh, and and recognizing, you know, Harvest is NASA's contribution to GeoGlam. Um, what what would what role would you see um, for for Harvest and, and its contributors going in, into the future? Uh, I'm really glad you asked me that because it's it's impossible to underplay the, the real impact that Harvest has had on GeoGlam. Uh, particularly NASA was brilliant in creating a program that had a five-year funding. Five years is very long in a government context. That brought stability and the excellent work that's happening around the crop monitors, both for markets and, and uh, food security, are, are critical. And so that stability has allowed us as a community to look beyond where we are now. And now we're looking at uh, defining essential agricultural variables it came out a bit from the talks up here, but there's a real desire from the market side and the food security side to, to have more quantitative information around this. This is required for markets, but also things like sustainable development goals and climate change and so on, where, where we really need to be more quantitative and look at things not just within a growing season, but look at what's happening over the longer term. So I think uh, a lot of the research, uh, some of the work that Matt showed and some of the work that showed up yesterday in the, the market, uh, event we had in the morning. That research is right on track to, to really contribute to these. And as we all evolve as a community, Harvest is well positioned to continue to, uh, to help us move forward uh, and uh, really looking forward uh, with such great success in the first uh, part of Harvest to see what comes next. It's uh, very exciting. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so, so one question maybe to, to all of you, and I think listening to kind of Ian and where some of the priorities on the remote sensing side is, and I think um, we should always be very careful on thinking about what we think your priorities are. Um, I'd like to ask you, you know, what are some of the information gaps that you think either the research community, private sector, um, or other organizations can, can help to support um, and, and should be focusing really their, their efforts on in, within the, the um, remote sensing community? And anybody who'd like to answer that? If I may, I would say so we can always ask more, but maybe also from the, our side, we, we need also maybe to improve our um, information network. Because I, I would say in production and forecast yield, you are maybe better than what we can do in terms of uh, forecast price, I would say, on the market. So this is why I, I think, first of all, maybe we have also to improve our uh, collection of data sometimes. Uh, it's very difficult today to have, uh, for several regions of the world, uh, price at destinations. We can do, we can do for, for, for price exports, but price at destination is very complicated. So we are close to, uh, we are working on it to have a better information of price of destination. And I do believe then we, it would be very interesting to cross your information in terms of forecast yield on production and also our information on trade. And that means then we can assess better climate event which impact on trade patterns. But I would say if we have as an economic community also to improve, I would say, our information. But definitely that's something would be very interesting to develop further. And another point I would say, but here I'm, I know that I'm really going uh, outside the boundaries of what is possible today. Um, when we do our supply and demand, uh, I would say we add a different type of grains. Uh, when we talk about soybean, we add the soybean from Argentina, Brazil, and US. 
but I'm not necessarily the same content of crude protein, vegetable protein. So that means we talk about raw material, but not necessarily the nutritional value. I know we are not yet there uh, in, techno te in technology, but that's something would be very interesting if we can move forward, because then we don't touch only the raw material, but we can go further in terms of markets, premiums about quality, but also uh, uh, the food security aspect. So that's also another topic, I would say, which may be very interesting to develop for the future. Great. Thanks very much. Does, um, we are out of time. OK, I'm getting a message that we're comp <laughs> Um, I'll okay, so if anybody else wanted to, to have a, a quick comment on that or, or not, I mean, I think for, for, for us, and I think we, we have um, within Harvest recognized that there's that we have to establish these strong partnerships and they've got to be long term and, and, and continue to work both with the operational agencies, understand what the priorities are, and how we can really help and support to, to forge these partnerships and, and continue to move forward. And part of our role is really uh, facilitating also partnerships, whether they're internally w across uh, within countries and within different organizations or really across and, and internationally. And thank you very much all for, for participating in, in this panel. And uh, we'll wrap it up.